I've come here today to ask your help. I don't think I've ever said that before in the beginning of a speech, but it's the simple truth. That's why I'm here. I need your help. Let me see if I can explain to you why I need that help, and let me see if I can persuade you to give it to me. So I used to have this job, um, which was advising the heads of state and heads of government of countries around the world, um, lots of them, about 53 at the last count. And it was a great job, and I enjoyed it very much. In some ways, there's nothing more exciting than talking to the leaders of countries about their vision for the future and how their country might engage in the global community. And they would very often talk to me about their problems. They would talk about the problems their country was facing. And after a number of these interventions, I began to realize that I was hearing the same stories over and over again. And after a few years, I began to realize that I couldn't remember the last time a country had told me about a problem that it was suffering from that was unique to that country. It was the same 20 or 30 issues repeated over and over and over again. They were suffering because of a problem with the movement of people. They were suffering because of health. They were suffering because of poverty or inequality. They were suffering because of economic turmoil. And so, I was very lucky. I would get to meet with the experts in each country, the experts in those topics, the experts on climate change, the experts on migration, the experts on health. And I would always ask, as my first question, sorry for my ignorance, but do we know the solution to this problem? And the experts would always say, oh yeah. And so I would say, well, forgive me for being naive, but if we know the solution to the problem, how come it's still a problem? And they would say, oh, right, yeah, OK. It's because we don't have the resources. And I would say, forgive me for being naive, but if this is such a big problem, then surely you could make the resources available. And they would say, no, it's not as simple as that. You see, the resources that we would need to tackle this problem, because it's not just our problem, it's an international problem, are more than the resources that we have as a country. And so I would say, OK. Forgive me for being naive, but why don't you just work together with some other countries? And I would normally find that that was the end of the meeting. <laughs> and I began to wonder about this a lot, and it used to perplex me enormously when I was flying home. And I'd be reading the newspaper on the plane, and I'd see that the planet was melting, as usual, and people were killing each other, and people were starving. And here were all of these countries facing all of those issues, and for some reason, unable to work together to resolve them. And so I cast my mind back to the 1680s. And I remember when we signed the Treaty of Westphalia and we brought the modern nation state into existence. There was somehow an unwritten rule, and nobody ever wrote it down, but we all know it's there, which is that the countries of the world, the nations, are warring tribes. And their number one rule is to screw each other as best they can. I'm exaggerating a little, but fundamentally that is kind of the way it works. Politicians, people in positions of power and authority, have always had a very simple, single mandate. It runs something like this. When you acquire a position of power and responsibility, you become responsible for your own people and your own slice of territory, and that's it. You've got to do the best you can for them. And if in order to do the best you can for them and for that slice of territory, you need to shaft somebody else's people or somebody else's territory, so much the better, because you look even tougher when you do it. Now, I began to think to myself, this kind of rule, this basis for the international system really isn't working anymore because of these shared global challenges. You push it down in one country and it pops up in another. No country is in charge of all the factors that are shaping its destiny. We all know that. China can't fix climate change. America can't fix economic turmoil. Europe can't fix migration. We've got to work together if we're going to fix these things, and yet we don't. We've got to update that mandate of governance to a dual mandate, 
that runs something like this. If you're in a position of power and authority, you are responsible for your own people and for every single man, woman, child, and animal on the planet, whether you like it or not. You are responsible for your own slice of territory and for every square inch of the Earth's surface and the atmosphere above it, whether you like it or not. And if you don't like it, you shouldn't be in a position of power and responsibility. So what we're looking at here, I began to realize, is not a new solution for climate change or a new solution for poverty or a new solution for pandemics. What we're looking for is a fundamental change in the culture of governance from one that has been traditionally competitive to one that one day becomes fundamentally collaborative. In other words, the first instinct of any government will be to work together with others and the second instinct to compete. Competition is fine, don't get me wrong. Competition is a very powerful human instinct. It's inside all of us and it's driven many of the greatest achievements of humanity over the centuries, no question about it. But competition becomes a problem. In fact, it becomes a pathology when it is the only altar at which we worship. And if you want my simplistic explanation for what's gone wrong with the world in the last 100 years, it is that we have worshipped exclusively at the altar of competitiveness and we've forgotten collaboration and cooperation. So this needs to change. So I began to think to myself, I really want to have more conversations like this, and I found it very hard to have them with the politicians that I would advi was advising because this thing called the national interest always got in the way. So I thought, let's see if we can start a public conversation. So I had good experiences in the past publishing rankings. I love data, I love numbers. I'm not very good at it, but I love doing it, and I find that they're very powerful. And so I thought, what about a, ba a balance sheet for the countries of the world? What about something that measures how much each country contributes to the world outside its own borders and how much it takes away? What about an indicator that can tell us whether we should feel glad that certain countries exist because they help the world that we live in, or whether we should worry about certain countries because they're taking away more than they give. They're free riders on the global system. So I thought, hmm, sounds pretty simple. And we'll call it the good country index. Not good the opposite of bad, but good the opposite of selfish. And so I started work, I gathered some friends together. We thought it would take a couple of weeks, it took a couple of years, but in the end, we managed to come up with something that sort of held together and felt quite good. 2014, the first edition of the Good Country Index was ready. And I received an invitation from a very exciting organization that you may have heard of called TED. And Ted said to me, would you like to give a TED talk? And I said, yeah, you bet. And can I use it, please, to launch the first edition of the Good Country Index? So they said, sure. So I went to a friend of mine who knew lots about TED because he'd given a TED talk. And I said to him, I said, Steve, am I going to get 28 million views? <laughs> and, uh, and he said, um, actually, no, um, because I've looked at TED talks over the years and I've discovered that there are basically two different kinds. Right? This is very technical. There's the boring kind, and there's the interesting kind. And yours is the boring kind, because, because you're complaining about the state of the world, and those ones don't do well. The ones that do well, the ones that get tens of millions, those are the ones where um, you talk about how you can get more sex or something like that. And they do incredibly well, always. So I said, oh, OK. Will I get a million views? And he said, no. He said, boring talks like yours, some of the really, really good ones get about 100,000. So I said, oh, okay. So I gave the talk. I thought it went pretty well. The audience were really nice, and they clapped. And, um, and I went home, and I had a call from Ted um, about um, 24 hours after the video went on the website. And I said, are you calling me to tell me that I made 100,000? And they said, oh, no, you said, your talk made 100,000 in about 45 minutes. And I said, what? Why are you calling me then? Are you angry? <laughs> and they said, no, we're calling you because your talk was the fastest to a million views ever. It was a million views in less than a week. So I thought, what? I did that? And it just carried on. It's slowed down now, but it's just past five and a third. Now, the reason I'm at five and a third million views, now, the reason I'm telling you this is not to show off much. <laughs> 
<laughs> it is the greatest single achievement of my life. But, <laughs> but mainly because of what else happened as a result of that. And what happened is the beginning of the second part of my story. What happened was I started getting unbelievable quantities of emails. Emails from people all over the world. Not just rich people in America and Western Europe who watch TED Talks, but people all over the place. Many of whom couldn't write English well. And they were all saying very similar things. And by the time I put them in a separate folder and started thinking, I was answering them. I, I have a sort of strange problem that I can't ignore a message that's directed at me. And my family were getting incredibly worried because I was sitting up sort of 20 hours a day answering thousands and thousands of emails. And then I realized that I'd received about um, 18,000 of them. And I thought, really, that's quite a lot. And <laughs> they were all saying very similar things. And what people were saying was this. They were saying, I, I love what you were saying about countries needing to cooperate more. I love that. I wish my country would cooperate and collaborate more. I want to live in a good country not a prosperous or successful country. I want to live in a country that works with other countries. When my president or my prime minister goes off to the G20, I want him or her to come back with a deal for everybody, not just the best deal for us. So I thought, well, that makes sense. But then they started telling me very often about their own selves, quite intimate stuff about their childhood. They would say things like, do you know, it's funny. When I was growing up, I always, always thought that foreigners were going to be more interesting than people from my own country. Isn't that a funny thing? And I always thought that other people's countries would somehow be more interesting than my own country. And I've always felt that I was a citizen of the world first and a citizen of my own nation, which I love very much, second. And I've always felt that the global challenges are somehow more important than domestic challenges. And I'm so annoyed with our politicians who seem like overgrown school children squabbling in the parliament about tiny local things when the planet's melting and people are killing each other. And I found myself thinking, they sound just like me. This is the kind of stuff I say, how many of us are there? And because I'm a very poor but very enthusiastic statistician, I thought I'd try and work it out. So I sat down and I did some textual analysis of these thousands of emails to see if I could try to define what kind of personality traits these people had in common. And I called it natural cosmopolitans, people who just instinctively, through nothing to do with their education or their wealth or anything of that sort, just naturally feel that they're members of the human race first. And then I went to the World Values Survey with the help of my friend Robert Govers, who is a proper statistician, and we figured out that if you set the bar very, very high, the really, really, really hardcore natural cosmopolitans are about 10% of the world's population. Now, my first reaction was disappointment. I thought, well, 10%, that's a minority. It's actually quite a small minority. But then my now co-founder, Madeline, said to me, you know, Simon, 10% of the world's population, that's quite a large number. That's 760 million people. And we thought, 760 million people. If that was a nation, it would be the third largest nation on the planet, after India and China. More than double the size of the USA. That would be a force to be reckoned with. If there was a nation that big, all of whom, whose citizens belong to that nation for the single purpose that they wanted to change the culture of governance worldwide from fundamentally competitive to fundamentally collaborative, then the culture of governance worldwide really could change because a nation of 760 million people would be powerful enough to really drive that change. So we kind of looked at each other and said, let's do it. Because that nation's there, it's a virtual nation. They don't know that they're members of it. It doesn't know that it's a nation, but if we could somehow grant it its sovereign status and turn it into a nation, then boy, that could really make some changes around the place. Much more so than a lot of the movements that we see today that really only are able to make a noise. I belong to dozens of them myself, and I'm sure you do. And they campaign, and they lobby, and they make a noise, and they raise awareness, and raise awareness, and raise awareness, so you can't even sleep at night. But what do they actually change? Very often, very little. What we want here, forgive me for being a little right wing about this, is something with some cojones. You know? <laughs> something that can actually shove countries around and bang their heads together and make them work together. Not just do campaigns, for heaven's sake. And a big country could do that. And another thought struck us, which is that you wouldn't have to have those citizens paying very big amounts of taxes for you to generate quite a substantial economy. 
And we did a few calculations on the back of an envelope, and we figured out that if each one of our 760 millions was paying five US dollars a year in taxes, well, you've already figured out the answer. That's basically the same figure as the GDP of Sierra Leone every year, except luckily for us, we don't have Sierra Leone's problems to contend with. So that figure, billions of dollars, would be available each year to actually exercise some change around the place. So that's the good country. It now exists. We opened our doors about three weeks ago. We have citizens from over 100 countries, all paying $5 each. It's the most exciting thing I've ever done in the whole of my life. It's utterly, utterly, utterly compelling. I've given up sleeping, I've given up eating, <laughs> I've given up talking to my friends. All I do is sit at my computer all day writing emails to people. And so this is why I've come here today, because I want your help. The one thing I really, really, really don't want to do is to try to reach out to those 760 million people in the conventional way. I know they're there. They know they're there, but we don't know each other there. We haven't met yet. What we know about these people, and perhaps some of you are amongst them, perhaps you recognized yourself in that little character sketch I did there. I don't need to sell or market or argue or persuade for those people to join a good country. It's obvious that they want to. They want two citizenships. They want a citizenship in their own country where they look after the domestic agenda and their own local social issues, and they want citizenship of the good country where their personal international self can find its own fulfillment. So they're dealing with the whole world on the one hand, and they're dealing with their own country on the other hand. They know they want it, they only have to hear about it, but how do we get them to hear about it? And so what we're trying to do at the moment is we're trying to build the world's largest and most effective unpaid volunteer organic ambassador outreach program. I've got to find a better name for it. <laughs> Let's call it the banana. We've got to build the best banana that anybody's ever had. I mean, lots of people have tried to do this before organic outreach. We have to do it better and bigger and faster than anybody else has ever done it before. We're going to need thousands and thousands of people. We've started, we opened our first um, uh, banana in um, the what we call the low countries, which is rather absurdly um, the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Suriname. We add Suriname, although it's not traditionally thought of as part of the low countries, but because it happens to be Dutch speaking, and we have a fantastic guy in Suriname who has promised to convert 75% of the population of Suriname into good country citizens. This kind of enthusiasm is everywhere we go. It's absolutely thrilling. So we have the low countries network actually up and running. And what I've come here tonight is to ask those of you who live in the Netherlands, will you please help us? Will you join it? You don't have to do very much. I'm not going to pay you, I promise, because <laughs> I can't. But what I would like you to do is to see if by linking together and by spending a few <coughs> hours a week, no more than you can comfortably do, just whatever comes easily, you can help tell people, reach out. Reach out to the media. If you ever met a journalist, ring them up and say, do you know somebody just started a country? It is such a privilege to have a job description that when you tell people what you do for a living, they think they've misheard you. <laughs> I get this every day. People say, what do you do? And I say, I just started a country. And they say, you just started a company. And I say, oh, country. I mean, how often does that happen in your life that you have a job that people think they kind of heard you properly when you tell them what it is? You could all be saying that as well. I'm just starting a country. Um, and uh, so tell the journalists. I'm so disappointed in journalists. I mean, I, 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 I have this sentence which I've been repeating over and over again. Please tell me it's not true. Definition of a journalist, somebody who's not interested in anything. I bring up journalists and I say, I just launched a country, and they say, yeah. I mean, isn't that quite an interesting thing to hear? They don't think so. <coughs> One day, I'm sure they'll be reading this. Reaching out to your friends, your networks, students particularly, undergraduates, because they're not yet so worried about paying mortgages and things like that. They tend to love this idea and they tend to want to reach out. Conferences, I love to speak at conferences. So invitations of that sort. It's very, very simple. All you need to do is to send me an email if you'd like to be part of this great network. Okay? Here's my email address, simon at good.country. Simon at good.country. Write me an email, I will answer it. I may be answering at 3 a.m., but I will answer it, and I would like you to help me join the network. 
and then we're going to do one in every single country on Earth, and we're going to get hundreds of thousands of people, and we'll end up building this extraordinary virtual 21st century digital nation of 760 million people, or maybe more, and we'll start making some changes around the place. Do you want to help me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs>